Okay, guys, we're starting. Yes, you can start. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome to our 12 Italian Table Talks entitled Rebuilding Our Community. I am Gianfranco Sorrentino. I am the managing partner of Il Gatto Pardo Group, and also I am the president of Gruppo Italiano. Gruppo Italiano is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to promote the Italian culinary culture here in the United States. First of all, let me thank Elias Lee, founder of Philin, for helping us organizing and run the technical aspect of, of this uh, webinar. I also have to thank my wife, Paola Bolla Sorrentino and David Ernst, who co-produced this event. This is our 12th chapter in this uh, series of, to allow experts in their fields to discuss issues pertinent to the restaurant and the hospitality industry. Today, we, are talk, we will talk about how the hospitality industry and the Italian hospitality industry has been supported in the United States, as well as the future of our industry in effort to rebuild our communities. 2020 has been a devastating year for all of us, and especially for the hospitality industry. First, we had the tariffs, then the COVID-19 outbreak, then the killing of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter protest, the riots, then the awful second wave of COVID, which resulted in the closing of the indoor dining. And now again, we are facing new tariffs on imported products. In addition, offices are empty. More and more people are working from home. But is the New York power lunch dead? And are we going to be what was considered before normality? Today's webinar will highlight three of the most important aspects in helping us rebuild the hospitality industry. The PPP round two, the vital importance of our work culture, and finally, an update on immigration. The recent announcement by the government of a second round of the stimulus package, the PPP, is the bridge to survival for the restaurants, food and hospitality communities. Let me say that according to the National Restaurant Association, more than 25% of the 600,000 restaurants in the U.S. are now closed permanently and another 30% are closed waiting for a better time to try to open up. And Mr. William Dahai, uh, partner at Don Bartolo Miller, is an expert of federal, state, and city financial suit we have had on previous webinar. He will present and explain the details of the stimulus plan after months and months of congressional negotiation. It is vitally important that restaurant, important distributor and producer understand what is the package and how to take most advantage of its offering. To explore the future of the work culture, we welcome Mr. Derek Mention, Senior Vice President for Advisory and Transaction Service at CBRE. After 10 months of this unthinkable pandemic and the mass exodus from traditional workspace to the virtual Zoom and Cisco worlds, we ask ourselves, are we better off? Are we more productive, creative, or even happier? This is a debatable to many. However, it is important to understand that the maintenance of the work and the productivity needs to be done on a daily basis, something it can be effectively done virtually. But this is not necessarily innovative, nor does it create a high-performing cultural society. The physical workspace, the office, is where the stronger relationship exists and the weak ones as well. The politics and interaction within the workspace all in one place is where important face-to-face -face human interaction occurs. It cannot be replaced by FaceTime. To wrap up our webinar, we will touch upon the subject of immigration with Mr. Nicola Tegoni, also partner at the Dunnington Bartolo Miller LLP, a Gruppo Italiano board member. Suddenly, millions of hospitality workers were followed or internally lost their job during the pandemic. As a result, they were forced to return to their country of origin to the economic hardship. 
as the economic slowly picks up again and hopefully soon will be robust, their job will eventually come back into marketplace. How then this worker abroad return to the United States? How can we assist to bringing our workers back? Will the new Biden administration create an easier path for immigration to this country? Finally, let me say that all, we all need to further ask ourselves, what can we do to improve individually at this particular time? Speaking for my own business, we had to reinvent ourselves. Otherwise, we would simply go out of business. The future is not going to be what it was yesterday. I, uh, like other restaurateurs, must change. We needed to think out of the box. We needed to find the new channels, new opportunities, new means of business. We cannot merely return to business as usual. In our industry, about 75% of new restaurants close in the first year of business. This is sad but true. No banks finance restaurants because we are a very risky industry. We typically operate at a very thin margin of profit. Small operators pay bills from last month with the revenue from this month. Students from culinary institutes spend thousands and thousands of dollars to graduate, and then they will find a job that can pay minimum wage to start. Change must start soon in promoting, educating, and communicating that good food, quality food, while it may cost more, is ultimately worth the price. So all these questions demand answer, and to help us, we invited other, our esteemed panelists for this discussion. I will start with uh, William Dahil, as I said, his partner at the law firm Dannington Bartolomew Miller LLP, and he's an expert of federal, state, and city financial support. Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Giancarlo, for the um, introduction. Uh, John, uh, John Franco, sorry, I'm a Yankee okay. fan, so Giancarlo is uh, one of my one of my players on the team. But in any event, John Franco, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I this is at least the third thing. I think it's the fourth time I've had the pleasure uh, and and the honor of being invited um, by Gianfranco and, and Paula to participate in these programs. Um, before I, and I have a few things to talk about the kind of evolution and of what's happened over that time period. Before I go further, I have to uh, do the required disclaimer as an attorney. Uh, anything I'm discussing here is really for informational purposes. Um, shouldn't be relied upon as legal advice, although certainly may engender you know follow-up communications at some point because you know there are some twists and turns um, and developments and continuing developments in the law that you know may require legal advice. But today is informational purposes only. As Gianfranco said, um, I am a uh, partner at Dunnington Bartholomew Miller. A large part of my practice involves working with businesses of all sizes on their different issues and disputes, um, ranging from employment through you know just general commercial disputes that one may have. Uh, last. Uh, you know, spring and the craziness of what started happening uh, in March and April, uh, you know, it was the first time around the first time I had an introduction to John Franco. And uh, as I was listening to him and make reference today about his uh, need to, uh, and the industry's need to make changes and adjustments and reinvent selves, you know, it's remarkable because in the first uh, one of these I participated in, which was in May of last year, very early on, uh, the first PPP had just been published, but it was already crazy about the monies had run out. It was refunded. The rules got changed. It was really a crazy time. But what was uh, important then is uh, people such as John Franco and other panelists who participated from the industry um, had a consistent theme, which is which is be strong. Um, understand that we're going to need to change and, and, and understand that we're going to need to be flexible in order to survive in this, in this time period. And I think it's a real uh, uh, credit to John Franco and others who have done that and continue to do it. And, you know, before we went live today, there was some discussion of the light at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully that's the case. Uh, in any event, I'm here to talk about the what's being called the second draw PPP 
loan. Um, by way of quick background, the initial program um, began in very quickly, a $2 trillion program put together in about 10 days and began in April of last year. And between April and August of 2020, uh, under that program, $523 billion uh, were lent. Uh, and it was lent uh, apparently to 5.2 million different businesses. Now, as we may recall that there was money added to the program because it did run out in about 13 days, as a matter of fact. Uh, at the end of that process, there was $120 billion that was not utilized from that allocation. In any event, as we all know, over the course of the fall, there was much back and forth about new programs. And finally, in late December, the new law came into effect and it allocated $284 billion to, again, what we're calling the second draw PPP loan. I'll give you some basic information um, about that program. Uh, the first thing is, is that when, when can you make an application for it? Uh, the a program opened last week for certain, um, uh, it was at, the monies were allocated a time period to uh, various minority uh, and uh, female owned businesses to provide an opportunity for some that didn't get an opportunity to get the loan timely last time. So that's been actually open for about a week. Tomorrow, January 19th, is when the program opens to all participants. And right now, the program is authorized to go through uh, the end of March, March 31st. Uh, there is um, some difference in the eligibility requirements for this second draw. First off, there are no public companies permitted. As we know last time, one of the reasons the, third, the monies disappeared in 13 days was the number of public companies that um, helped themselves to some of the money. Secondly, the size of the businesses is smaller. It used to be 500. It's now down to 300. Um, also, to participate in the second draw loan, uh, you have to have received a first draw PPP loan. Now, I'm going to come back to that because that raises a number of different complications, but I just want to flag that at this point. And the other thing is, and it's related to that, is that you have to have received a first draw PPP loan and you have to have used it. And again, this is a topic I'll come back to because it's raising some questions I think are the answers to which are not yet clear, but hopefully will be clarified at, at, at some point. Probably the biggest change with regard to the eligibility for getting a PPP loan on the second draw is that there is some financial need demonstration required, unlike the first time. Although the test is not that stringent and presumably particularly in the restaurant and hospitality industry probably I would assume could be met. And basically what you need to demonstrate is that if you compare the same quarter of 2020 with 2019, it can be the first, second, third or fourth quarter, you need to demonstrate that you had a 25% drop in gross receipts in that time period. Uh, again, if you have and gross receipts is very broadly defined, uh, there's very specific provisions, but basically it's, it's, it uses a very similar concept to, uh, to the tax code. So if you have a 25% decline, if you compare the same two quarters, 19 and 20, you are eligible. It's possible, by the way, that you could have had a decline in each of those quarters, but less than if you, if you measured 25%. So if in the event that you may not have a specific quarter in which there was a de decline of 25%, but your overall year yielded a 25% decline, um, then you remain eligible. So again, that is a change from the uh, first, uh, first time when basically you basically had to just certify, I need the money. Um, now, one of the things I made reference to is that in order to qualify for the uh, second draw, you had to have had a first draw. So what that means is if there are um, uh, businesses out there that did not make an application the first time for whatever reason, um, you may now make your first application. Uh, so the, you are still eligible, although it will be, go under the rules of the first program, which has some slight differences, and one of which I'm going to get to later um, that I'm hopeful there will be some rule changes to make it more fair for the first uh, time drawers, which has to do with um, how much of a loan you can get. But in any event, if you have, did not go the first time, you are eligible now to go and to, to undertake a loan today uh, as a first time borrower, as if you had tried to do the same um, last spring and early summer. 
Now, the next question that arises is uh, you need to be able to certify that you, in fact, spent all of the money from the first loan. And that can be an issue because there can be some businesses that took loans, um, used the formula, but because of we're not able realistically to spend it, not because they didn't want to spend it, but because whatever the rules and requirements and the eligibility for opening um, didn't really permit use of, of those monies. As it stands right now, you cannot get a second draw loan if you did not use the first draw loan. Uh, I expect that there, this is an area in which there may be changes. Um, for example, one way to handle this is to have the rules be that if you didn't use the first draw loan completely, you could still use it now as if it was under the second program, even though even as if it was under the first program, even though you're outside the time period in which you were supposed to spend the money. Um, and if you spend that by the end of March, consistent with the proper uses, then you should be able to get a second draw loan. But that has not yet been put into law. Um, there are basically other things as well to keep in mind. If you had obtained a first loan and you didn't use it all, but you returned some of the monies, you are eligible to get those monies back again, use them. And if you use it in time before the end of March, you can then get a second draw loan. This is a tricky area that really requires a lot more analysis depending on the facts. Hopefully there'll be some rulemaking under the new administration that will make sense of it because people who took out a loan in good faith before couldn't use it through not their own fault, shouldn't be prohibited from now participating in the program. So that's something that needs to be fixed in, in, in my personal view. Um, one last thing I note in terms of eligibility, and I find this a good indicia of where, where we are as a country today, there's a specific provision um, in the law which says that a business that is uh, in which the president, vice president, the head of the executive department, uh, an executive department or a member of con uh, Congress or a spouse owns or controls 20% of the business. So I think you can see politics had a lot to do with what eventually did happen here, which of course is not a surprise. Uh, a important change now goes to the amount of the loan to wh for which you can be eligible. And this is a change that was specifically intended, there is a change that was specifically intended to assist the hospitality industry. Typically, the typical borrower will be in the same position it was the last time, meaning 2.5, you're eligible for 2.5 times your average payroll costs during the 2019 year. For the restaurant hospitality industry, the specific provision is you can do 3.5 times the your, your average payroll costs during the year. You can use 19 or 20. I think for most of that people, 19 is obviously going to be the year to use. I will note that there's a $2 million maximum. So that is something that was $10 million under the first program. It's $2 million under this particular program. Now, the point that I made before, if you're a first time borrower, which was not clear to me as I'm trying to piece together the different parts of the rules which come out almost on a daily basis, is whether a hospitality business as a first time borrower can take advantage of the 3.5. Again, if that's not clarified, that's hopefully something that will be put into effect with regard to the, um, by, by, by the incoming uh, administration. Uh, with regard to doing a second draw, um, by far you should stick with the bank you use the first time, unless there was a very bad reason not to, but the reasons are they have all your paperwork from the first time and they've developed a relationship. And I'll say this, um, while it's not always easy to give sympathy to banks, banks were put in a very difficult position last year where within 10 days they were told you're gonna start lending out billions of dollars with very little guidance and rules. Uh, my experience with a bank that we've worked with, and I know if I've heard from others, is that it improved dramatically over time. But if you use the same borrower you used before, they have all your payroll paperwork from the first time. You don't need to do that again. They know who you are. You've got the, you know, the, the electronic pipeline to open up. So it makes perfect sense that you would use um, that same lender. Now, the, well, the one difference is you will have to provide evidence to certify that you had that 25% decline um, that I mentioned before, quarter over quarter or year over year. Um, it's actually by rule a requirement for loans over $150,000 in the application, but as a practical matter, the banks are gonna require that you do it for any loan because you would still need it for forgiveness. Uh, the next 
big change here that is hopefully going to provide most help for people is that you can use the money for a broader range of expenses now. It still needs to be 60% used for payroll costs. And you can still use it for rent payments, utility payments, uh, as you could before. However, it now covers broader operations expenditures, such as business software, cloud computing services, product or service delivery, uh, ADP type expenses, human resources expenses, accounting or tracking of supply expenses. It also can be used for property damage if your property was damaged during um, uh, what's uh, euphemistically called up, or, you know, urban uprisings, which occurred uh, last summer. Um, a big piece is that supplier costs can now be included as an expenditure that's covered, such as the payment for the supply of goods essential to the operation of the business. So that will be, you know, a, a major, you know, basically what you need to run your business and the ordinary course now can become covered under the loan. And finally, and this is relevant to a lot of places, particularly here in the city, that it, it, it's monies that have been expended to modify your facilities in order to comply with law. So that the building of the plexiglass enclosures, the building of here in the city, the, the sidewalk uh, dining structures that have been built in, in the parking lanes along, those expenses are now eligible for reimbursement. Uh, the spend, expenditures on those are eligible for the forgiveness um, under, the, uh, under the new loan program. Also the same thing with the cost of PPE that you use for yourself and you supply for your employees. So those items have expanded what you can spend the money on and still receive forgiveness, but do bear in mind that you still need to um, have 60% go towards payroll costs very quickly. Some of you may not have seen this because it was, if you haven't applied for forgiveness, what, there was a change that's very important to understand about forgiveness which is if you were unable to keep your head count or your, your pay, if you recall, you may recall, you, were, you, you lost forgiveness if you reduced payroll head count or if you reduced payroll, payroll uh, compensation by 25%. The law rules were changed to acknowledge that some of those declines in head count may be driven by re legal requirements, such as having reduced seating within a restaurant, such as limiting you know, the number of people who can be in a particular space at a given time. So the, it's, that, that's a whole topic unto itself, but do bear in mind that there is now some, some uh, easing of the restrictions of head count in terms of obtaining forgiveness. Um, very quickly, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that the um, you probably heard, but these are good tax tax points. Number one, um, when the loan is forgiven, that money is not income to you for tax purposes. That was in the existing loan. But the thing that was changed recently with this law is that the expenses that you use the forgiven money for are deductible or included as, as business expenses for doing your taxes. Uh, finally, and I don't want to go over my time here, what I will say is that the new Biden proposal primarily focuses on things well beyond the restaurant business. However, there is a broad statement that it's intended to provide grants and loans to small businesses. You know, what that means has not been fleshed out in anything I've seen. But uh, to me, the main thing that the new administration can do is make sure that some of these kinks in the law um, that I identified be smoothed out so that people can make sure they get full advantage of what they've borrowed. I'm sorry, John Franco, I think it went a little bit over, but I'll stop there. No problem. Please, please, because it's uh, very important for all the restaurateurs and the hospitality industry worker anyway. Thank you very much. And uh, I already saw we have a uh, lots of uh, questions regarding that. Now let's pass to Derek Munchor uh, to address uh, that work culture in a New York space and workspace. Derek? Hi, Derek. Derek, can you, can you hear me? Uh, I'm mute. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt Bill. Um, thanks, Gianfranco. I really appreciate the invitation from you and uh, Paula and uh, look forward to, for uh, uh, an opportunity to spend time with this, uh, with this panel. Uh, the question is, uh, is, is the office dead? 
And the answer is no. In 2020, we arrived uh, at, the, uh, uh, at an accelerated uh, moment, but we arrived at work from anywhere. We are now a, a culture uh, that uh, has uh, as its uh, dominant uh, characteristic, the ability to work from anywhere. Don't be mistaken, however, we have not arrived at the end of the office, okay? We have arrived at work from anywhere. We have not arrived at the end of the office. We know a few things. Uh, the first thing we know is that uh, high performing teams uh, need to be together. There is uh, ample evidence uh, that what people need uh, is the opportunity for exploration, for uh, being energized, and, uh, and the best place to do that uh, is when we can be together. When you're in an office environment, you have uh, strong ties and you have uh, weak ties. Strong ties, typically people in your group, people who sit within 60 feet of you. Um, then you have weak ties, uh, people who are outside your core group, but still work in your office. And then uh, you have an opportunity to engage uh, with a variety of people, stakeholders, uh, clients, uh, staff, et cetera. What we know is that when we do not have the opportunity to be together for uh, more than 15 hours, productivity begins to uh, deteriorate. Uh, what uh, we also know is that initially companies can maintain some productivity, some level of productivity, uh, but over time, the innovation uh, begins to deteriorate. And that's because uh, we know that historically, innovation comes from when we have an opportunity to interact spontaneously, not with those with whom we have strong ties, but with those with whom we have weak ties. When you bump into someone uh, at, at, at the coffee, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lunch, in, uh, in the hallway, uh, these spontaneous interactions have historically been the ones that have produced the aha moments for uh, business uh, productivity. And uh, they are not available in a Zoom world. Uh, we, we've seen uh, that normally, in an office environment, 45% of the time we spend communicating with our strong ties. We also typically spend about 30% of our time uh, interacting with uh, weak ties. In 2020, what we found was that our interaction with strong ties has increased dramatically, well over 60% but our interaction with weak ties has fallen off the table. Um, it's down 30 to 40%. As a result, it's impossible to have uh, a high performing culture. It's impossible to create teams that, uh, that have created uh, trust and safety. It's impossible to have uh, mentorship. So uh, many of the hallmarks of uh, a high productive uh, office environment uh, are absent when we are working virtually. So it's not surprising that we've seen, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon uh, uh, look at his data and call everyone back to the office at JP Morgan. Uh, he specifically said that not only has, produ has productivity begun to deteriorate dramatically among his 20 and 30 somethings, it's particularly awful on Mondays and Fridays. Um, no surprise. We've also uh, seen um, a uh, uh, sophisticated uh, users of office space uh, begin to double down. I would call uh, as one example, Facebook having taken 750,000 square feet, the entirety of the Moynihan building, the new uh, Moynihan office building that will be uh, the new Penn Station. So, uh, so any of the early exuberance one might have heard about uh, being able to maintain productivity or being able to save a few dollars uh, on uh, real estate costs or being overwhelmed by the data that shows that uh, we will be back in the office. Uh, we need a vaccine. 
uh, because uh, uh, those of us who are not in our 20s and 30s know enough of our uh, colleagues uh, and our children who are in their 20s and 30s to know that going to the office isn't necessarily the safest thing. We can't necessarily trust their judgment. So uh, we need a vaccine and, and a vaccine is on the way. Uh, we need, uh, frankly, um, an economic package uh, the, of the kind that the new Biden administration has proposed uh, in order to, by the third or fourth quarter, uh, begin to see uh, some more robust economic activity. And, um, uh, and I think with those two factors in place, uh, we'll be back in the office and, and we will be uh, back on a course to a more normal environment. Um, I think just as a, as a note for restaurants, you mentioned, Jim Franco, that you had to think outside the box and that you've had to change your business and that you've had to really be nimble in order to respond to opportunities. And that's uh, left the Elgato Pardo Group in a relatively good place compared to some of uh, your competitors. Uh, we are seeing with our restaurant clients clear winners and clear losers. Uh, the the uh, winners are the folks who have done what I think we've seen you do at Gattapardo. First, you've placed your people first. Uh, the, the, the way you treat people in the hospitality industry is going to determine who wants to work for you. And who works for you is going to determine how successful your enterprise is. So uh, it's easy for me to see uh, my kids who are living on the Upper West Side want to come to the Leopard all the time because they have choices and they can go to any restaurant uh, that they want, lots of disposable income. And yet it's really clear that uh, a few things are working for the Leopard that I think are replicable in the restaurant industry. We're seeing our clients who are thoughtful about where uh, they have chosen to locate. If you are located in a high residential density um, uh, area, then uh, you have a chance. If you are uh, uh, flexible in terms of uh, both uh, service and um, menu, um, uh, you have a chance. And I think that uh, when you look at those restaurants that have not uh, done as well, uh, the most obvious example is the old uh, Four Seasons and the new Four Seasons. Uh, the old Four Seasons restaurant uh, was an iconic location. Uh, it was an iconic design. And uh, long uh, before uh, uh, it was uh, foodies uh, was a thing, uh, they had uh, uh, delivered organic, they had delivered local, uh, they were creative about uh, the quality of their enterprise. James Beard ran it, and um, uh, there's a reason for the James Beard Awards. So when they re uh, established a new Four Seasons restaurant, we'll call it Four Seasons 2.0, they spent $40 million on the space. In a lot of ways, it was a gorgeous space. Why did the restaurant close in less than one year after uh, the Four Seasons had been a historic iconic brand for uh, five or six decades? And, and, and I think the answer uh, gives us uh, cautionary tales for uh, our current environment. When folks come back to work, they're gonna be um, drawn to those restaurants that are uh, uh, deeply committed to uh, service and, and hospitality whose people are deeply committed to their mission and, and, and their values. And, and I think it's uh, important that um, uh, our clients who are uh, retailers know that, um, that it, this isn't uh, going to be like it was, but there will be great opportunities uh, for some uh, many winners. Thank you very much, uh, Derek. Before I pass to um, to Nicole, I want to ask you something because uh, you are in the real estate. I saw that in uh, New York, at least, that the rent, the, the the residential, is going down dramatically, and this will give the opportunity to young couple, artisanal students, artists, musicians, to come back to Manhattan. 
do you think this uh, uh, low rent is going to last a long time or is going in a year, two years, Manhattan is going to be an, again a skyrocketing about the rent? <laughs> well, it seems highly likely that there will be a new opportunity for a new middle class in Manhattan. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, replicate the um, frothy environment that Manhattan had uh, been enjoying for the last decade or, or, or two in the future. I think that there are uh, clearly um, uh, opportunities for, um, uh, I'll call it a, a middle class, uh, a working class, an artist class, um, uh, that would not have been available before because I think there will be a, among the affluent, uh, there will be a continuing flight to New York and a continuing flight to A type properties. But I think among the affluent, the um, B minus and C properties that uh, may have been occupied uh, by uh, upper income folks uh, uh, before are, are, are probably not going to be uh, as um, uh, as uh, uh, attractive to uh, to the affluent, and I think there will be an opportunity for uh, uh, somebody who wants to start a restaurant, somebody who wants to have an art studio, to uh, return from uh, uh, Brooklyn or not Brooklyn, from Philadelphia, <laughs> to to uh, to New York. I do think that there is going to be a middle class in New York City. Thank you very much, and uh, Nicola, uh, shall we give an uh, an update? on the immigration as it's going? Certainly, thank you Gianfranco. I'm deeply honored to be here with you, with you all this afternoon. First of all, let's talk a little bit about January 20th and, um, and what's coming. I think we are all um, excited about this new um, uh, era that is um, coming to us. Um, there has been a lot of talk and a lot of uh, speculation as to what is going to happen come uh, January 21st in the realm of immigration law. And um, I think it's fair to say that um, we will see very quickly a comprehensive uh, immigration reform uh, bill introduced by uh, the Biden administration before Congress very swiftly. And, um, and this is going to be, I think, in the form of some sort of earned legalization bill. So it's not going to be an amnesty, but um, it's going to be probably something that is going to look like a, a seven to 10 year path towards uh, eventual uh, um, citizenship for um, individuals that have uh, maintained good moral character in the United States, that have uh, uh, duly paid their taxes, and uh, that have contributed uh, significantly uh, through their employment or through their activities for uh, the betterment of um, the American society, particularly also during uh, these uh, uh, difficult uh, past years that we, have, uh, uh, that we have experienced. So this is, I think, something to be, um, to be looking forward for, uh, for all of us. Now, it's... Um, I think before us the fact that um, unfortunately a lot of uh, employees, foreign citizens, were either uh, laid off or uh, temporarily suspended from uh, their employment during, uh, during the past year. And so there is some significant uh, legal ramifications that have to be addressed right now as employers and employees are facing um, the prospect of uh, uh, being either rehired or returning back to work. So it's important, I think, to start to distinguish between those individuals that have maintained and continued their employment that perhaps may be stationed abroad, for that have been stationed abroad for a period of time and are now looking to come back to the United States. And those individuals that have been in the United States that somehow have been um, through no fault of their own for the most part, either furloughed or, or laid off. Those individuals that uh, have found themselves abroad, I think uh, uh, have uh, quite a direct path to be able to return to the American shores and continue and resume their employment if they have maintained um, a, an employment situation with, uh, with their employer. 
So for example, let's look at a situation where a, a restaurant manager or a chef or a maitre d' had to leave the United States for reasons that they have to do, they had to do with health or they had to do with family reasons or simply um, they were told to, uh, to return home for a period of time, but their employment was maintained. I think it's pretty fair to say that um, they do have a, um, a very direct path to be able to re-enter the country, proving that um, their re-entry and their continuation of employment will significantly benefit um, the economic improvement of uh, American society. Uh, so I think that is something very positive. Now, with respect to those employees whose employment was uh, suspended and uh, been furloughed, we have to um, look at it a little bit differently. So those, uh, those employees, um, you know, the very first thing that employers would have to look at is whether or not we have to go through a new I-9 system, for example. So employers that have furloughed or terminated employees, they must determine whether they're required to re-verify each employee's work authorization on Form I-9 if and when the employees return to work. And that is uh, uh, regardless of the employee's immigration status, this applies to anyone. In general, employers must complete a new Form I-9 whenever a hire takes place, unless a rehire occurs within three years of the execution date of the employee's previous Form I-9. In certain situations, an employee's return to work after an interruption in employment is not considered a hire and would not require the employer to re-verify the employee's employment eligibility on Form I-9. If an interruption in employment occurs, such as a furlough or a temporary layoff, employers must determine whether the employee is continuing in his or her employment and at the reasonable expectation of employment at all times throughout the AHENOS. Employees returning to work following a furlough or temporary layoff or lack of work, approved paid or unpaid leave on account of the employee's illness or our family member's illness or disability or other temporary leave approved by the employer are considered to be continuing their employment despite the interruption. Thus, employers must consider several different factors to determine if these employees had the reasonable expectation of employment at all times throughout their break and subsequently whether re-verification on Form I-9 is required when such employees resume employment. This determination and the employer's obligation with respect to the employment eligibility verification will vary depending on whether the employee is returning to work after a furlough, temporary layoff or termination. Employers without sufficient work or business operations to continue employing foreign temporary workers should be aware that placing, for example, H-1B employees on unpaid furlough due to lack of work, which is known as benching, is specifically prohibited by the uh, US Labor Department and federal immigration laws. Employers should also be aware that the majority of temporary foreign workers on employment-based visas which does include E-visas, for example, L-visas, O-visas, and TNs for Canadians, are in violation of their immigration status upon termination of employment, which can then lead to adverse immigration consequences for the employees. So if an employer is terminated, laid off, or otherwise placed a temporary in an immigrant worker on unpaid furlough, a foreign national who happens to be, for example, in E-Staros or H-1 Staros or L-Staros or O-Staros or TN-Staros, will have a grace period of up to 60 consecutive days or until the end of their unauthorized validity period, whichever is shorter, to change Staros, find a new employer for sponsorship or depart the United States. If the sponsoring employer rehires a furloughed or terminated foreign workers within the 60 day grace period, the foreign national employee may resume employment with the sponsoring employer without the need to file a new visa petition, so long as the employee's petition approval period has not expired 
and the employer is now withdrawn or revoke the approved visa petition. Employers should be aware that foreign workers who are, for example, in E-Staros, H-Staros, L-Staros, O-Staros, or TN-Staros can only use the 60-day grace period once per petition. Conversely, if the foreign national employee seeks employment with a different employer, the new employer must file a change of employer petition with the USCIS before the end of the foreign national 60-day grace period. Employers that have shut down business operations in specific locations due to the impact of COVID-19 and the need to relocate foreign workers to a different work site, work site should consider that, for example, if an H-1B employee is transferred to a remote work site location that is separate from the place of employment, which has been designated in the labor condition application and the h one petition, the employer must first determine if the geographical location of the transfer is considered a material change in the terms and conditions of employment that would require the filing of a new ACA with the Department of Labor, along with an amended I-129 petition with the USCIS. If an employer places an H-1B worker outside of the geographic area, of intended employment because of service disruptions caused by COVID-19, the employer is required to file an amended petition in their regard. Now, this doesn't apply to situations where, for example, an employee is presently working in the United States on, uh, on e-visa status. It's very important to determine that uh, before reducing a foreign national's workers' hour or wages, the employer should carefully review and consider the wages and working conditions promised to the employee in, in the governing visa petition. Employers across the US have implemented reduced hours, salary cuts, and other cost-saving measures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Importantly, employers should be aware the reducing an H-1B worker's hours from full-time to part-time is considered a material change in the conditions of employment, which would require the filing of a, a new LCA. The Department of Labor defines full-time employment as 35 hours or more per week. Similar to the H-1B context, employers are required to disclose whether a proper position is part-time or full-time for other temporary worker visa petitions filed on Form I-129. As such, a reduction in hours from full-time to part-time for other non-immigrant worker categories, which include the E-Visa category, the L-Visa category, the O-Visa category, may require the employer to file an amended visa petition with the applicable federal immigration agency. Employers who lack sufficient qualifying work for full-time foreign employees in H1, L1, or O1 status should consider amending the employee's visa petition to undertake part-time employment status. To justify the need for the foreign labor in the United States, sponsoring employers must demonstrate active business operations and sufficient available work for foreign and immigrant workers throughout the entire visa validity period. This is of particular importance for non-immigrant workers in need Staros, H1B, L Staros, O Staros, or TN Staros. Moreover, H1B sponsoring employers must establish that H1B employees will be performing specialty occupation work consisting of duties that typically require the attainment of a bachelor's degree level of education in a specific field of study or specialty. Although ordinarily foreign non immigrant workers are excluded from claiming unemployment compensations, there may be circumstances when they can. Unemployment insurance benefits are administered separately by each state in accordance with federal guidelines to provide cash benefits to eligible workers. While eligibility requirements vary from state to state, in general, states require the recipients be available to work and actively seek employment while claiming benefits. Recipients must be authorized to work at the time of filing for benefits and during the entire period of collecting benefits, in addition to meeting applicable state requirements for wages earned 
or time work during an applicable established period. The majority of non-immigrant workers must receive approval from the federal immigration authorities before engaging in employment. <laughs> federal immigration laws also limit certain non-immigrant workers' employment authorization to performing a specific role with the sponsoring employment. Because of such barriers to accepting employment, non-immigrant workers whose status is tied to a sponsoring employer, such as e-visa workers, H-1B visa workers, J-1, L-1, O-1s or T-1s, are unable to satisfy the able and available to work and work search requirement. However, for a nationals employed pursuant to an approved employment authorization document, we likely be able to accept uh, unemployment insurance. And now it's important also to note that uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic, specific states have expanded unemployment insurance benefit specifically for individuals on uh, temporary work visas to cover um, these individuals benefits as a result of um, you know, COVID-19 um, um, situations. Well, grazie Nicola, thank you very much. The law is uh, so complicated that that show up why we need a lawyer to take care of those things. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, after we, uh, I will go through some of the uh, questions that uh, we have from uh, our Registered. The first one is for uh, for Bill. Um, any restriction to majority foreign-owned business for the PPP application? Uh, the, the answer is is that as was it the true the first time through the answer is is no as long as it's a the, the employment itself takes place within the United States so it's it's a payroll protection program the idea is that you need to be employing U.S. folk well people within the U.S. Um, that employees don't have to be citizens but the, you need to be operating a business that is employing people um, within the U.S. and that's the same as it was the first time through. And again, another question. Will the 3.5 multiply apply for wine distributors? And so happy wine industry. I'll, I'll confess, I, I cheated and saw that one pop up because I wanted to have an answer for it. And the answer is, I believe, <laughs> no. Uh, the just very quickly, um, the codes, there's a code that's called the NAICS code, which is a coding that's utilized within for a variety of reasons, including under the SBA programs. And the 70, the, the coverage for the 3.5 is under the prefix code 72, which generally consists of restaurants and, and accommodations and, and sleeping accommodations, very broadly speaking. Um, wholesale, generally speaking, and retail, uh, retail and wholesale sale have their own separate categories and I believe that the uh, a wine wholesaler or even a, a distributor within in that program would come under code 42 which would mean no um, it's worth double checking yourself if you've ever had to deal with NACIS codes before to see if there's a way to consider yourself under 72 but based on about three minutes of uh, research while I was listening to Nicola's description it would seem not Thank you very much. Nicola, something very important. Can a visa worker apply for unemployment? Well, as I was mentioning in the presentation, uh, it depends. So there are really three situations to consider. The first situation has to do with whether or not they are considered to be available to work. So if the, the visa worker visa is tied to one specific employer, the general answer is, is no. But if uh, the visa worker um, benefits from having a so-called employment authorization document card where they're able to really work for multiple employers, then the answer is likely yes, because they are available to, to work for multiple employers. Then the third scenario is what I was explaining at the very end of my presentation, which has to do with uh, these COVID-19 exceptions to uh, unemployment insurance that various states have enacted. So 
an, an employee would have to look at um, all those three examples before making a, a determination. Thank you. And the, probably we have still a few minutes for the last question, which is a kind of strange, but uh, let me mention that, uh, is uh, for uh, Bill. I pay myself a low salary, but uh, take a large draws. For the PPP application, must I only include my actual wage or can I include my draws when I calculating my 2.5 amount? It, it's, okay. <laughs> um, it, it's a yeah, that's a question that it would need a lot more information in. So let me give you some broad guidance on it. And, and there was something that changed after the first law was put into place because it wasn't clear how sole proprietors um, were were to be included within the particular computation. So for example, initially it wasn't clear that partners at law firms, such as Nicole and myself, could be included within that computation. And you would look at it. Turns out that after some clarification, you could. What you need to do in order to answer that question is you need to understand what is your, I mean, you're saying your term draw. Are you something that could be considered under the law a sole proprietor? Um, which then you need to, once, once you, if, if the answer to that is yes, you, there, there are then a formula, there's a formula to apply and how much you are able to um, use of your, of your draws to compute what you may be eligible for. Um, so the answer is maybe, unfortunately, I can't give you better than that, but if you are, can be considered a sole proprietor, and if you then look at the formulas, which, and the banks will help you with this, right, because it's on the loan applications, there's actually very specific provisions about this, um, you are, there's specific provisions to the computation, there's a limit, it's not an unlimited thing, you can't pay yourself everything you would normally pay yourself in a draw, but it is, it is possible under the modifications. The other thing is, you know, just to know now, uh, and some of you may have seen an article recently about how some of the payouts that people got who were sole proprietors were so low, you have to have had a profit. In other words, your business has to have shown a profit even as a sole proprietor in order to be eligible for this, which is why literally apparently some people um, receive loans of about $3, believe it or not. Uh, in any event, um, that's, it's a short answer to a very complicated question, but it's worth that individual person who asked the question following up because the answer is you may well be able to include some of those draws. Uh, I have a question regarding the and the documents that we have to uh, show for the PPP, you said that we have to show a decrease of 25% in a quarter from 2020 to 2019. Now, the second quarter by the governor order, we were all closed and practically we show a 100% uh, decrease. Can we use that quarter? Yes. Yeah, you, you can use any quarter. It's actually, like I said, the first time there was no really definition requirements. Now there's this, but it's relatively straightforward and simple. So yes, if you simply would demonstrate that you had something that shows your revenues for Q2 in 2019, which I'm sure for your business was very robust, even in a slow time here in the city, and then you'd compare it to you know zero. I would anticipate that the restaurant industry uh, participants, the hospitality industry is going to have no problem showing these declines um, over, you know, for any particular quarter in the, or for the over the course of the year if need be. Thank you very much. I think we are done with the today webinar. Uh, I want to thank all our panelists for joining us today, as well all of you who registered to watch. Thank you very much, Bill, Nicola, and Derek. Thank you, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Gianfranco. Thank you, Jeff Franco. Ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao.